Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review. Get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar on smart energy management for better energy efficiency. This webinar is brought to you by the Interreg Europe uh, Policy Learning Platform. And my name is Katharina Krell. I'm your moderator. I'm a thematic expert with the policy learning uh, platform of Interreg Europe. And I'm very, very happy uh, to be with you today. I would like to introduce uh, my team. I'm here with uh, Simon Hankin, thematic expert uh, like myself uh, with the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform, our web expert, uh, Lotte von Meyel. And we're having a discussant uh, today who is going to help uh, with the moderation. So uh, we're having Beatrice Rico Sanchez from Achenex, that's the Extremadura Energy Agency. And uh, well, Bea is coming from uh, one of the Interreg Europe uh, projects, one that is specifically focusing on energy management. And due to her special expertise, we have invited her to ask all the expert questions today to our speakers. So uh, um, a few words of housekeeping. As usual, we are recording this webinar and uh, you can uh, replay it afterwards. Uh, it will be on our portal. You will receive all the presentations uh, that are shown today. And uh, since you have registered uh, to this webinar, you will receive everything by email in your inbox shortly. The audience uh, can interact with us uh, mainly through the chat. My colleague Simon is monitoring the chat and any questions uh, he's bringing up uh, uh, to the speakers to their attention. So please uh, uh, make sure to use the chat function and don't be shy. Um, yes, that's it uh, in terms of housekeeping. Why do we want to talk about uh, smart energy uh, management systems? It's, we are in a context of, yeah, I mean, energy is precious and the energy efficiency first principle says the energy that is most precious is the one that you don't consume. So to know where your energy consumption is high, you need uh, data and sensors so that you can understand where to act on your energy consumption. Data as a precondition for proper energy management. And ultimately, smart energy management systems are also important to allow consumers to become prosumers when they have their own renewable energy systems and uh, that requires also smart meters and the digitalization aspect. So uh, overall smart energy management systems are allowed to monitor and to control, to optimize the energy usage. Today, we will mostly focus uh, on the building level. So what I say will be in the context of buildings. Um, we see the deployment of sensors, meters, and software platforms uh, that allow to analyze and to display data in an intelligible way. And uh, that then in turn allows to adjust uh, behavior or to automatically adjust uh, heating or, or cooling or minimize uh, the, the waste and uh, increase the, the overall efficiency of the energy that we're having. Um, clear advantages uh, are better energy use, but also the reduced cost. So smart meters may be quite interesting in a context uh, of energy poverty as well. So it's not just something for fancy and wealthy of uh, uh, people. Um, it's also relevant for increased comfort and convenience uh, for occupants of buildings. And uh, uh, overall, clearly all the efficiency arguments 
with the ultimate aim to reduce our environmental footprint and to lower our carbon emissions as we have all these targets. Okay, um, before we dive further into smart energy management uh, and uh, uh, I present you the agenda, I would like to hand over to my colleague uh, Simon who is presenting uh, the Interreg Europe and the policy learning platform which is behind the organization of this webinar. Yep, uh, welcome everyone also uh, from, from my side. Uh, so yeah, we'll take a brief moment to present the PLP and its activities. Um, so while Interreg Europe helps policymakers to find solutions to the, to the challenges that they face and provides expertise to those who design and implement policy uh, through exchange of experience and capacity building activities. Uh, the program has two actions, the projects in which regions can work together uh, on common policy challenges to exchange and transfer experiences and work with their regional stakeholders uh, to develop an action plan to then be implemented in their region. And the second is the platform, uh, which further exploits project achievements and opens up the benefits of the program to all. Uh, it does so through a number of services, aiming to provide access to knowledge, to people and to expertise. Uh, so we'll briefly go through these one by one. Uh, for access to knowledge, the platform provides a database of more than 3,000 expert validated good practices uh, from which regions can learn. Uh, we also provide thematic articles highlighting key project achievements and especially impressive uh, good practices, as well as policy briefs looking more in depth at specific policy issues. Uh, so you'll see here on the screen a recent one on today's topic and a link to that will be shared in the chat. For access to people, we have a database of more than 25,000 community members uh, who can be reached via the platform. Uh, we also arrange networking and policy learning events, such as workshops, webinars, and online discussions. Uh, so recordings of all of our past events can be found on the website. Uh, finally, for access to expertise, we provide a policy help desk uh, where you can request support and we will assemble an answer for you to highlight available resources, ideas and good practices. Uh, we have matchmakings, which are dedicated sessions in which we'll find community members uh, for you who can present solutions to a particular policy challenge. And then we have peer reviews, which are two-day events in which peers from the community will visit your region uh, to learn the specifics of your challenge and develop recommendations on how to tackle it. Of course, we draw our lessons and recommendations and also our experts from our projects. And in the area of smart energy management, we have several projects which have contributed. Uh, so on the left, you'll see the new projects, Monitor EE and Detox, uh, which are present today to share their expertise with us. And on the right, you'll find some of the projects from the last programming period, which can provide good practice for inspiration. Uh, you'll find many good practices from these projects in the policy brief that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, so with that, I'll pass directly to one of our new projects, Monitor EE, uh, to present a bit about their work. So Bea, over to you. Uh, Hello. Please yeah, hi to everyone. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank the Policy Learning Platform for this opportunity to be here today on behalf of the Monitory Project. Um, if you don't mind to change the slide, next one. Okay, um, the Monitory project is composed of six partners who come from different European regions. However, I would like to highlight a recurring problem in all these regions, which is that 85% of the European building stock was built when energy efficiency standards were less restrictive, meaning that 40% of the energy consumed and 36% of the greenhouse gas emission came from it. Next one, please. Um, this project was conceived a few years ago uh, when different questions arose at a, as, at a consortium level, okay? Uh, we follow three steps. The first one, to analyze how much energy we are currently consuming in buildings uh, with traditional fuel. fuel. Uh, the second, uh, mm, most of these buildings being uh, retrofit and we have 
currently some tools that allow us to know uh, the theoretical consumption of these buildings thanks to the energy performance certificates. But the main question that came to us was, are these figures real? So this is when the third step came, um, and it's the one that we will like to aim with the monetary to achieve with the monetary project, okay? And it's to improve policies that allow monitoring building real energy consumption. Okay, so uh, the next slide. Okay, the effectiveness of the mm -hmm. measures that I've been talking about, like uh, improving insulations, replacing windows, all these measures been taken through a long time. But the thing is that only with the energy performance certificates, we think that it's not enough. So we would like to go a step further by a smart management system and to improve policies that allow this smart management system to, to, to start working in, in the future. So next one, please. With all this emerge the monetary project and different activities to ensure the, ch the exchange of experience between partners, which in the end will live in the follow-up phase or sorry, during the core phase and we will monitor during the follow-up phase, this policy improvement that I've been talking about. So now just the last one, as I promised, I've been really uh, short time. Um, you can find in our website, the monetary website, uh, good practices related to these uh, different measures that we would like to 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 find. Okay, like today we are going to talk about the EMIS platform. Uh, is one of our good practice thanks to our Croatian partner and um, the co approach that. I think that you will talk about it later, but because it's going to be in our Vienna uh, event from the policy learning platform. So from the monetary side, I think that it's enough. If you want to know further, please go through our website. Uh, and if you have further questions, don't hesitate to, to ask through the chat, okay? Thank you, Bea. Um... So today on the agenda, we're having a very nice uh, a cocktail of uh, speakers, starting with a keynote. Uh, and I'm very happy to introduce uh, Christiana Machitelli from the European Commission's DG Energy. She will present the EU action plan on digitalization uh, uh, of the energy system. And uh, that will set the frame. It will go beyond uh, uh, the building level. Um, However, then our, our good practices uh, will be more uh, on smart energy management systems uh, uh, for the buildings. And we're having three here. Uh, first of all, the Smart Energy GB presented by Johan van Dijk of Smart Energy GB from the UK. It's nice to still have a UK partner, so uh, welcome. Then we're moving to Croatia to Davo Pintoric of the Croatian Government Real Estate Agency for a presentation of their energy management system for monitoring public buildings specifically. And uh, finally, we are going to hear a case study uh, with a specific tool from the hotel sector, the Eco Hotel Plus platform uh, for the region of Crete, uh, presented by Kostas Liguris of Innoveco from Greece. And afterwards, uh, we'll have time for questions and discussions. So uh, before handing over to our keynote, uh, I have uh, uh, two short polls for the audience. Um, very easy. Do you have smart meters at home? Do you have a smart meter at home? First question, yes, no, very easy. And then we want to see a little bit if amongst the audience there is a relation, a relation between smart meter and energy awareness. So for potential choices of answer. I have a smart meter and I know my energy consumption. Or I have a smart meter, but I don't know my energy consumption. And of course, then the other options. I don't have a smart meter, but I do know my energy consumption. And I don't have a smart meter and I don't know my energy consumption. So let's see. I have a smart meter, I can already tell you, and I know my energy consumption. <laughs> okay, let's see how the audience is voting.
Uh huh. Okay, sixty percent still don't have a smart meter. I don't think uh, that's a surprising uh, uh, number. I mean, we can turn it around and say already forty percent have one. That's pretty good. And uh, do we have a relationship? Most of you don't have an energy smart meter, but you know your energy consumption well. I suppose that it's because you are working in the sector that you are particularly aware. Um, Okay, great. Thank you very much. Then let's hand over to uh, Christiana. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. It was a pity that I couldn't uh, reply uh, to the poll. I belong to the category that uh, don't have the smart meters but know the energy consumption. So um, I, it really fits perfectly because um, I will talk about... Um, um, uh, our behavior as a consumer and how to uh, reduce our environmental impact later. So it's a really good cue. Thank you so much. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm super happy to be here because I'm a great believer in uh, sharing uh, best practices and have policy updates. Uh, I am Cristiana Marchitelli and I come from DG Energy, the unit responsible for research and innovation, digitalization and competitiveness. Uh, we have um, developed, I, I've been asked to um, give you a little description of the um, action plan of digitalization of the energy system that we have developed uh, one and a half years ago already. And uh, why we have um, developed this? Because you know that uh, we have, um, our energy system has been increasingly uh, um, decentralized and the more uh, it is decentralized, the more it's powered by renewables and we uh, we know that digitalization can help us accommodate this new energy landscape. So why we did this in the first place? Um, you know very well that uh, we are now uh, talking uh, all in all about um, the twin uh, green and digital transition. So to fast forward this uh, twin transition, we need an energy system that is uh, much more much smarter than it is today and much more interactive. So uh, we need one that relies on data exchange and digital technologies so that uh, we can make um, the use of resources more efficient and the energy transition to more renewables more efficient. So um, digital technologies are, uh, as a matter of fact, a crucial enabler to decarbonize our energy supply. That's why we have... Uh, Sit, sit down with stakeholders and we have uh, come up with um, six um, main building blocks of the digitalization of energy action plan. So the first, um, it is a pillar, like an overarching framework, is uh, promoting a seamless um, exchange of energy data to foster new energy services. A second pillar, which is really all, um, also super important, is uh, fostering uh, more and better coordinated investments in the digital solution for the electricity grid. Third, um, empowering consumers to uh, for them to benefit to from new ways of engaging in the energy system through digital technologies. Uh, but we also have the other side of the coin. I mean, all of this is nice, but we also have some challenges, and these challenges uh, are strengthening cybersecurity and addressing the energy consumption of digital technologies. As a sixth part, uh, we have identified a number of uh, cross-cutting actions that are necessary to promote a better coordination um, between energy and digital actors among um, all levels, regional, European, and also international level. So uh, let's uh, quickly dive into these uh, actions. So the first level, the first intervention area, aims at facilitating the access and uh, exchange of energy data to develop new clean energy services. Um, I told you before, we've, we've done this through, um, with the consultation with stakeholders, and we have identified three high-level use cases to begin with flexibility services, 
smart and bi-directional charging uh, of electric vehicles and uh, the uptake of smart buildings and renovation. And I think that this is also very, very interesting to you. Um, how we want to um, go about this, um, we propose uh, to start preparing a common European energy data space, meaning um, an interoperable framework of common standards and practices that are specific to the energy sector so that we can share data and um, have a framework to jointly process this data. We have many um, data spaces, especially the health one after COVID, but uh, it's also useful to um, create a new one on energy because we need this to have data interoperable and uh, make the digitalization of the energy system happening. Uh, of course, a framework that comes with it is a data exchange governance structure so that we guide and manage all the process. Um, within this, um, it, I, you, you know for sure, last year the Commission adopted an implementing act on interoperability requirements and procedure for access uh, smart metering and consumption data. This is very relevant and it's close to what you will talk about uh, today. So this, is, uh, this was done in the framework of the Digitalization of Energy Action Plan because this is a very important building block. Um, how we want to do this, uh, we want to create firstly an expert group um, that has many responsibilities that have uh, also um, um, the participation of member states and all the relevant stakeholders. So to set up um, data for energy working group so that we define what are the building blocks of this data space and uh, implement uh, a governance uh, structure in coordination with all the other data spaces that we have in place. The second area is very important, is about stimulating investments in uh, digitalization and smartening of the grids. So uh, we have uh, policy objectives, we have the repowery objectives for renewables and energy efficiencies. And to reach those objectives, it is estimated that we need about, um, about 600 billions of electricity infrastructure investments between 2020 and 2030 in particular in the distribution grids. So um, grids are like the, um, the, the, the pillar of this digitalization of the energy system. So we need to strengthen and constantly modernize the existing ones and deploy at scale smart components that are there and are still needed, like smart meters in this case. Um, how we want to um, make these investments. So first, we will support transition, uh, transmission system operators and I mean TSO and DSO uh, in creating a digital twin of the electricity grid. So a virtual model that enhances the efficiencies and, and the smartness of the grid. Uh, we, are, uh, we are collaborating with ENSOE and EU DSO to set up a task force so that uh, they can gradually develop this um, digital twin uh, and the aim is to help drive and coordinate the investments in the digitalization of the electricity infrastructure. So we really have a tailored approach on what we need and how much it is needed. Second, uh, we are working with NSOE, UDSO, uh, but this time together with the regulators. So ACER and SEER to develop a set of key indicators for smart grid. So smart grid indicators that should um, facilitate um, give a structure and, and drive future investments in smart grid. Also, uh, ensuring a convergence of the regulatory approaches that are in place right now to this topic and, um, and yes, facilitating the future monitoring. Going back to ours, us as consumers, um, consumers is the third uh, pillar of the action plan. And in this case, we talk about um, consumers uh, within the framework of um, what are the digital solutions that we have at place as a mean of um, increasing empowerment. So increasing also um, outreach and uh, the active involvement of citizens in the energy transition. So a very important aspect here is to ensure that digitalization uh, in general 
does, doesn't undermine the framework of consumer protection that has already been established in the electricity, in the elect internal electricity market. So um, it is important to mention in this respect that uh, the Commission has launched a fitness check of uh, EU consumer law on digital fairness. This is really happening like now as we speak. So this is super important to give us a framework and to protect our rights as a consumer. We also propose in the action plan a series of measures that are specific to um, the energy and the use of digital solutions to empower consumers. For instance, in the framework of uh, the bridge project, we have identified uh, strategies to uh, engage consumers in the design and use of accessible and affordable tools. You mentioned Katarina before, the issue of, of energy poverty, this is really relevant in this case. Um, in terms of information and um, access, uh, our colleagues of um, DigiConnect uh, are uh, in the process of developing a common reference framework for an application to help consumers to reduce their energy use, especially during peak hours. Uh, this was developed during uh, COVID and during the uh, energy crisis, so at the time it seemed very, very relevant. Um, in addition, we propose to develop tools, uh, guidance, and uh, like a first-of-a-kind platform to facilitate the use of digital solution in energy communities. This is done by our colleagues from the Joint Research Center, our scientists. And also, uh, for your information, I think it's very uh, useful, uh, in the framework of the Energy uh, Community Repository, we have published a toolbox that uh, provides practical examples of digital solutions for energy communities in different scope of applications. So from development response to monitoring and um, um, Katarina uh, will, uh, and, and Lotte will uh, share all this information, all these links uh, with you. So it will be super useful to integrate it in the learning platform as well. And lastly, um, talking about um, skills and how if, if we are really well equipped to understand what's going on in terms of digital literacy, uh, we have worked towards this, the establishment of a large scale partnership uh, for the digitalization of energy value chain because last year was the year of skills. Actually, I think it's ending in May. So uh, this is a really, really important um, action in, for empowering uh, citizens and consumers. Uh, now going into the challenge part, uh, uh, we know a more decentralized generation and consumption uh, of all these digital devices connected to the grids, it really increases the, let's say, surface uh, attack uh, of the energy system. So it, there is the risk of increasing um, cyber um, attacks. So how we want to go about this? Uh, we have already legislation in place. We have cross-sectoral legislation like the NIST 2 Directive, the Cyber Resilience Act, uh, or the proposed Council Recommendation on Critical Infrastructure, which was adopted the day we adopted the action plan. But we also proposed measures uh, that are specific to the energy sector. So alongside the cross-cutting ones, we have something that's really specific to what we need in the energy system. And two weeks ago, not even in the 11th of March, we have adopted a network code for cybersecurity aspects of cross-border electricity flow. This is very, very, very relevant to uh, complete the, um, the regulatory framework in place. On uh, the other side of the coin, so challenges and opportunities, I would say, uh, we uh, have measures to reduce the carbon footprint of the ICT solutions, meaning measures that increase the energy efficiency. Exactly as you said, Katarina, uh, the, ener the, the energy efficiency, we can uh, resume it in the energy that we do not use. So uh, how we can make the use of ICT tools as a driver to uh, increase the energy efficiency and promote the um, use of renewable energy sources. And here we act at, at several fronts. So we have an energy labeling scheme for electronic displays which are uh, at the top of energy consuming devices at the moment, but we're working really hard to come up with an energy labeling scheme for, commu for computers, for instance. Uh, we are working on measures targeting communication networks, for example, aiming at an EU code of conduct for the sustainability of the networks. And we have a latest deliverable on that 
on the website that Katarina will share. Um, and we also aim at addressing the energy consumption of data centers, which are becoming more and more important, uh, like the biggest uh, consumer of electricity at the moment, considering that we have all these emerging uh, technologies and also considering that streaming cloud computing um, are part of our life. I mean, streaming, this is what we're doing now at the moment. So, um, and data centers are uh, expected to um, exceed uh, like 3% of our electricity demand by 2030. So this is becoming huge. Um, to, to mitigate this risk uh, in the commission, we are recently, we are currently uh, working on establishing uh, a common rating scheme to rate the sustainability of data centers, to promote new design and uh, have like appropriate uh, efficiency interventions. As a last point, we have the cross-cutting measures to enforce investments and coordinate how the different actors work together. Firstly, and most importantly, we want to help member states prioritize and implement the investments in digital energy solution. And of course, we do this through the revision of the NECP, so the National Energy Climate Plans, but we have also the Recovery and Resilience Plan, so we try to have a dialogue with member states. But also we try to use uh, our multi-annual financial framework to accelerate the development and the deployment of innovative digital solution. And uh, we have uh, part of the research and innovation unit. So I would like to uh, just briefly touch upon this. We have many uh, topics under uh, Horizon Europe uh, work program, uh, but we also have funding opportunities that exist under the digital Europe program, the cohesion policies, and LIFE program. I'm sure that you are all very acquainted with that, but with LIFE, we have a particular sub -pro program that's called Clean Energy Transition and has a very big chapters devoted to buildings and energy efficiency. And this is the topic that you are particularly interested uh, in, in this moment. So uh, projects that deal with digital tools and data supporting decision-making for energy efficiency related intervention, especially uh, building a renovation projects. So um, for instance, we have projects that support um, the reliability of key instrument like um, the energy performance certificates, the integration uh, with the smart readiness indicator, as well as um, the the automation of the issue of uh, the building renovation passport. So I will um, leave you with an overview of these projects uh, in the PowerPoint that uh, will be shared with you. Um, and uh, before leaving, I have um, this uh, important priority, which is the creation of this platform for structural cooperation between energy and digital actors, because there we really would like to cover um, all levels of policy making and both sectors. So this is a, a big endeavor that uh, we're really working at the moment. So um, this is, I think, also relevant for you. And uh, with this, I finish my uh, brief, brief overview uh, of the action plan. I hope Katarina stayed in my uh, in my time allocated. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christiana. It's uh, very important that you paint the big picture for us, uh, even though we are mainly focusing on smart energy management uh, systems in buildings today. It's important to understand the wider context of a digitalized uh, energy system and uh, how everything is uh, fitting together. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting also for the local level will be the toolbox uh, for digital, I mean, the digital toolbox for the energy communities. Yes. Energy communities are a hot topic uh, for our audience because, well, it mainly happened at the local level. Um, so it's relevant for energy sharing and the peer-to-peer -peer energy exchanges. Indeed, Indeed. yes. We could organize a webinar on this uh, topic in the future. Um, oh, for sure. The toolbox is already ready, right? Since last year, is it correct? It is correct. Um, you can find it in our website so that you can share it with the participants. Definitely. Okay. Uh, well, you already elaborated uh, um, 
I think on the importance for regions uh, in your EU-wide uh, approach of the digital innovation hubs. Um, is there anything, any specific message uh, for our type of audience that you're having on that? Um, yes, I mean, this work is ongoing. We plan to create this platform that will be called Gathering um, GDI, so Gathering Energy and Digital uh, Innovators. And uh, why it is important for you? Because uh, the part of the digital innovators will be covered by the, the European digital innovation hubs. Those hubs are really have a huge regional component, and yet they have a pan-European networks. These are uh, one-stop shops that are designed to offer regional specific support while being part of this pan-European network. Why it is important for you to know? Because um, these hubs are supporting companies, but also private sector organization to respond to their um, digital challenges and try to understand how to become more competitive. Because I mean, the more local you are, the more you are pressured with this international uh, competition. So um, their regional presence is really, um, they, they are the best equipped and the best suited to provide services to local companies uh, through their local languages and tailored really to their specific in, um, innovation ecosystem. So um, I'm, if the participants know about this, uh, uh, I'm sure uh, it would be good repetition, but uh, if they don't really, um, they are um, really a one-stop shop and uh, they will help you uh, find a way to integrate uh, digital uh, uh, tools and digital energy tools uh, mm. for your uh, daily work. And uh, also those were not only funded by, uh, they're funded by European funds, yes, uh, like 50% for member state, uh, regional association also, uh, the other part is provided by the European digital uh, program. Mm -hmm. But um, the regional association together with national ones were the one helping selecting those hubs. So really uh, the, the, the role they play in the regional innovation ecosystem for the digitization is huge. So I think it's very important for the participants. Well, thank you for pointing that out and for providing the contextual uh, uh, background. A last quick question uh, from uh, the audience. Orlando wants to know if the digitalization effort that you're mentioning is focusing only on electricity or is it on all energy, meaning also on gases and fuels? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, we are, f um, I, I can say we're focusing um on electricity but we also have gas yes thank you very much okay great uh well thank you and i know that you have to leave but thank you for carving the time out of your busy agenda to uh, be with us uh, for this keynote and uh, maybe we'll get back to you uh, for more uh, information uh, um, on the the ideas that you mentioned uh, to us today thank you christiana thank you uh, i will be available thank you so much you have a great workshop. Good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, so now that the scene is set, let's move on to our specific good practices. And the first one is coming to us uh, from the UK and over to Johan uh, for the presentation. If you unmute yourself, it will work better. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have been uh, invited today. Um, as you say, uh, although we are no longer European Union member states as a proud European citizen, uh, uh, despite living in the UK, I'm, I'm really pleased to have been invited today to share um, more about uh, our campaign and my experience within it. Uh, so I am Johan van Dijk. I have worked for Smart Energy GB's campaign for the last eight years um, as public affairs manager. Um, I've experienced many shifts in consumer understanding and openness to smart meters and the evolving energy system. Um, and I hope that what I share about our activities and learnings today can support the work in your regions and communities. Uh, so we were set up in 2013 as the uh, UK's consumer engagement strategy saw a benefit in creating a central campaign delivery body for the smart meter rollout. Um, our smart meter rollout is voluntary, where the aim was to put consumers at the center of the rollout and get people more engaged with the changes and the reasons behind them. 
Um, all homes are offered a small digital screen, which gives them near real-time energy use information, uh, which we know does help people to use their energy more efficiently, cut back when and where they can. Um, and I have a special challenge to those who answered the poll saying that they don't have a smart meter, but they do understand their energy consumption. I challenge that you may not understand it as well as you could with the additional uh, digital information they provide. Um, so we don't install or manufacture smart meters, but we're the singular national voice communicating the benefits to households. We're established as an not, independent not-for-profit organization. However, we work closely with the UK civil service and industry to achieve our shared goals. Um, our board has a mix of consumer and industry representatives and subgroups, which helps set our targets and our budget. Um, and an important fact here is that independent modeling shows that our campaign activity on its own drives around 50% of smart meter installations in Great Britain. Uh, so what is our role? So we have three specific tasks, which is build consumer demand for smart meters across England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, but beyond this, we are also tasked with driving energy behavior change. So helping people to use their smart meter to use more energy more efficiently. And we also have a special task uh, set out in our license conditions to assist those who are in vulnerable circumstances, uh, both to realize the benefits of smart meters in the day to day, but then also to not be left behind in the progress of the rollout. A bit of an update on the rollout in Great Britain, more than 34.8 million smart meters have been installed across GB, that's as of the end of last year, it represents 61% of all meters uh, in homes and small businesses. Um, we know that people who already have smart meters broadly have a good experience, including some that you might not expect. Uh, those on low incomes are just as likely to have a smart meter installed, uh, showing that a low income is not necessarily a barrier to engagement with smart uh, smart energy management. And people in Great Britain who prepay for their energy are more likely to say that their smart meter makes a difference to their energy use at home. So more importantly, why do smart meters matter? So they, they do contribute to a 25% savings in carbon dioxide uh, in homes in Great Britain, which make up about a third of the emissions in Great Britain. Um, beyond energy, the National Health Service in the UK is exploring smart energy data in telehealth solutions. We've also conducted some research of our own in this previously, which I can share with you. Um, but more recently, smart meters are a key enabler of the Demand Flexibility Service Program, which is run by the National Energy System Operator in Great Britain. Uh, this program incentivizes homes to turn down or turn off their energy use at certain times of day with some advance notice. Um, in November and December of 2023 alone, uh, this enabled energy savings to power nearly seven and a half million homes in Great Britain during these events. That's over a quarter of the homes in Great Britain. Uh, 9.3 million pounds was earned by suppliers um, through the savings, which was then passed on to households who participated in the form of either money, points, or prizes for their participation. Uh, so it, it it goes to show that, that people do, when, once they have the tools to engage with a more evolved, flexible energy system, they do take that opportunity. Um, back to our campaign, our organization is research driven at its core. Uh, we use multiple research vehicles to understand how people engage with smart meters and with our campaign. The largest of these is Smart Energy Outlook, uh, which is our twice annual survey of 10,000 people in Great Britain. We conduct this twice annually including with 3,000 people who are offline. Uh, we also conduct qualitative research, which asks specific audiences about their attitudes and experiences towards smart meters and energy, and deep dives to understand how our campaign resonates with distinct consumer groups. Um, part of this work also understands how these groups are engaging with the energy market as a whole, uh, particularly during the challenges of the energy and cost of living crisis in Britain. And our learnings through all of this research help us to evolve our approach to, to the rollout and our campaigns. And it has impacted our campaign over the years. Uh, so in the beginning, we started to raise awareness of, about energy with an unengaged population. It's a historically low interest category in, the, in Great Britain energy. Um, and we needed to get them to understand how smart meters would help them get more control over their energy use. Um, as public perception of the climate crisis shifted, we were able to pivot to the environmental and societal benefits of an upgraded energy system. Uh, the last couple of years have been more complex as I'm sure it has been for everyone on this call, 
uh, with uh, and particularly in the with the energy and cost of living crisis here in Great Britain, we've had to refocus on energy management and cost savings and move away from the future facing benefits. But as the crisis has softened and the national energy system operator continues to offer these demand flexibility service events, we've been able to shift again to supporting consumers to use their smart meter to engage with a more modern, flexible energy system. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have a special task to reach people in vulnerable circumstances. And I'm proud to say that while there's always opportunity to improve, the work is truly embedded across our organization. We do have advocates at board level and within senior leadership, including a dedicated consumer reference group. But we also partner very closely with charity and third sector organizations with specific experience. Uh, I'll name a few of them. One is the Royal National Institute for the Blind, uh, Carers UK, who support people in Britain with caring responsibilities. And one of our biggest partners is National Energy Action and Energy Action Scotland, who are a fuel poverty campaigning organization who, who lobby government, but then also support people who are experiencing fuel poverty. This gives us the opportunity to stay close to the experiences of these consumers while also sharing our best practice with, with industry and other stakeholders as well. Uh, we have quite a diverse audience to communicate to, and we need to reach everyone in Great Britain. Uh, we do have our resource center, which is freely available to anyone in Great Britain. Um, you'll see some of the resources on the left-hand side of the screen in Welsh and Romanian, but we also have them in Gujarati, Hindi, Polish, um, and other language iterations such as British Sign Language, Easy Read, and other formats as well. Um, our national and regional partnerships programs, uh, some of the partners you'll see there in the center, uh, they help us to spread the smart meter message through channels and audiences that we might not reach on our own. Uh, so the English Football League is our flagship partner that we've worked with for four years to reach those on a low income via both their national uh, organization, but also their community arms of 72 football clubs. Uh, Carers UK engage those who play a caring role to be an advocate for smart meters to the person that they support. And across 2023, we also worked with 38 regional partners to reach those in vulnerable circumstances, including people without fundamental digital skills, again, carers, and also those in fuel poverty. These include Swansea, Music Art Digital, Age Cymru Povis, and Enable Scotland. Uh, we do also reach specific audiences, such as private renters and small businesses and other groups who need more focus in order to support them on their smart meter journey. Uh, beyond the here and now with smart meters, we do have an important strand of work that explores what an upgraded energy system means for households and wider society. Uh, we partner with trusted expert organizations to deliver this research, uh, just a few of the reports that you'll see on the screen here. Um, and we really harness this work to influence policymakers and industry to drive this change forward. But uh, the focus for us is always at keeping consumers at the heart of all of this work. Again, this is uh, freely available research on our website, uh, which I'll be happy to share with you. And our upcoming work examines um, energy demand flexibility and uh, consumers understanding of what this actually means in practice, as well as smart EV charging and the related cost and carbon saving benefits. So I hope this has been interesting and inspires you to examine your own projects and your campaigns, uh, but then also to realize the potential opportunity for your organizations and the communities you work in. Please do reach out with any questions. And I believe Beatrice is back yeah. to you. Hello, Johan. Uh, yeah, I have one question related to your presentation. Hmm. Um, how do small meters communicate with the central energy management system? Yeah, so um, in Great Britain, we have the Smart Data Communications Company, or DCC. Uh, they operate the national network for smart meter data. Um, so they're the data transporter between uh, energy consumers or households and their energy supplier. Um, the data, however, can also be accessed by third parties that the households explicitly give their consent to access their data. For example, I myself, um, I have a third party app that monitors my energy use uh, in different ways and gives me energy use tips and things like that. And they're able to access that data with my consent, obviously, uh, through uh, the smart DCC. Okay, perfect. And um, I have another question. Okay, yeah, um, sure. this 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 is did this system face uh, technical or regulatory challenges associated with the deployment of the smart meters? Uh, you know, it did. Um, I think it's probably no surprise to anyone's 
for anyone who's familiar with the rollout in Great Britain, that there were some technical challenges towards the beginning of the rollout. Um, as I said, it was a very consumer focused voluntary rollout. Um, and it, when you have an infrastructure project of this size, there will be challenges. Uh, the primary one was the first generation of smart meters. The way that they communicated was actually not over this national network for smart metering initially, uh, but they had their own sort of dedicated uh, networks between the household and the energy supplier. Um, there were times when consumers would switch their energy supplier, so between, between supplier A and supplier B, uh, and the communication process was lost during that switch. That has been broadly overcome, and all of these first generation meters are actually being migrated onto the National Network for Smart Metering, or to the DCC. And I believe there are over 13 million, don't quote me, because I, I didn't actually look up the stat before this, but I believe it's 13 million uh, meters that have been migrated onto the system uh, since that began. Okay, so thanks a lot. It's mm. very interesting, good practice, to be honest. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I, I share that uh, uh, impression. Uh, thank you, Johan. Uh, also interesting to see uh, um, your communication strategy and through which channels you go and how you segment the target uh, population. And I'm also very much looking forward uh, to your future work uh, on smart uh, EV charging. Uh, that is another another big topic. Yes, we're very much looking forward to it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for your contribution. And uh, I would like to hand over to our next uh, good practice. Uh, so, Davor, the floor is yours uh, for your presentation. Uh, hello, thank you for your interest. Thank you for invitation. Do you uh, do I keep my camera on or? Yes, keep it on. Oh, and okay, okay, okay. No problem. Pull your slides up if you can. Okay, no problem. Okay, I start the sharing. Thank you. Yes. Okay, let's go. Uh, everything started. Everything started like this with this. Premise was uh, that by monitoring the consumption of the building, uh, the consumption will decrease because uh, we will heighten the awareness of people using the that particular building as, and by uh, catching all incidents, all extra extraordinary events uh, in consumptions like uh, I don't know uh, leakage or pipe water pipes breakage. Uh, First installation of EMIS became available on December 2008. Reduction is in consumption was due to a change, change, changing in behavior of building users uh, in small, uh, small energy efficiency measures. Up to 2014, monitoring of water and energy consumptions was uh, on voluntary basis and from 2014, EMIS became obligated by law for public institutions, for cities, municipalities, and countries, uh, ministries, uh, government agency, government agency in uh, Croatia. Uh, what is EMIS? EMIS is a web-based software. Uh, it's a main tool for uh, continually uh, collecting and analysis uh, water and energy consumptions in uh, public public sector buildings. Uh, it has a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities. It is a database one centralized database with easy access. Allows allows many analysis and interpretations of how energy and water is uh, is uh, consumed. Uh, a little bit about numbers. Uh, currently in Emmys we have around uh, uh, we have over 20 wide 21,000 buildings and we are also monitoring uh, public lighting in uh, in uh, municipalities and cities uh, around uh, all, all over Croatia. We have over 7,000 uh, 7, uh, users with different, with different roles and every role has a uh, different functionalities. Uh, the yearly cost of, uh, of um, maintaining and maintenance and installation of EMIS is around 307,100 
uh, euros per year, uh, which is included installation of smart metric systems, energy studies, our, educa our education of the new users and promo materials. Uh, here is a given data which Emmet collects. We are pushing forward the automatization to collect monthly energy and water bills with our readings from the remote metering, uh, remote metering systems installed on the public buildings. Sensor readings with, which are here, which are here uh, given uh, are collected within 15 minute period. Static, static data on uh, uh, buildings uh, is regarding energy system of buildings, the heating, cooling, air condition, ventilating, also, and uh, then the construction data of the buildings. M is also regarding the with the um, automation, auto, automated uh, input of uh, data. M is also has a possibility of manual input to uh, of, of has the possibility to manually input the uh, necessary data. I will skip this. Uh, Emis, as I said, Emis has a lot of functionalities. Uh, in this uh, example, is given the. In this example, is given how the how the installation of uh, thermal insulation of uh, outside walls decrease the natural gas in uh, natural gas consumption it curves are also uh, are also shown in emis uh, also with the uh, cumulative uh, cumulative sum for example if you have uh, a blue line shows the estimated consumption blue line shows the estimated consumption of this this uh i believe this is uh electricity on the uh one building blue line is shown a uh, estimated consumption of the uh, electric electricity electricity and the uh, orange line is the real consumption of the uh, is the real consumption of the that building Uh, results so far uh, using emis using using emis brings up to five percent annual savings in energy and water consumption, which is based on the three-year period calculation. Uh, during uh, COVID, savings were around sixteen percent. People were working from home. Uh, some objects, some buildings uh, aren't uh, weren't working. Pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, three year savings were around uh, 1,000 terajoules or around 290 millions of kilowatt hours, and reduction of CO2 emissions was around 100,000 tons in uh, money. This is about 17 million euros per year. Uh, also, EMIS was transferred installed in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Malaysia, Hungary, Russia, and Turkey. M is this indispensable tool for energy planning. For example, city of Velika, of Velika Gorica in the past year uh, by using EMIS and picking and nominating the uh, buildings from EMIS, selected the 22 buildings for installation of photovoltaic uh, systems. What we plan to do next, we uh, we plan to connect EMIS with Smith system for measuring and verification of energy savings. Uh, also, we uh, plan to connect EMIS with, with energy certification database, uh, increase energy efficiency in neglected areas such as public lighting, because we are uh, focusing more on the public buildings so we had we have uh, put aside public lighting uh, for a while uh, also last year we developed a module for monitoring fuel consumption for vehicles of uh, of uh, of institutions also in the last year and a half we are introducing sustainable energy management into multi apartment res residential buildings uh, from the National Recovery and, Resil and Resilience uh, Resilience Plan. 
in uh, in this part of our job we have uh, installed uh, sensors in totally anonymized uh, we have installed sensors in apartments in one multi-story building we have around i believe 80 buildings in six in six major uh, cities in croatia uh, so we are gathering the we are collecting the data from the sensor we are collecting data for inner uh, co2 measurement inner temperature and inner humidity also we are uh, we are connecting with the uh, energy and water consumption on the whole building so we we could uh, so we could uh, so that we can uh, gave, gave us some result of how to renewal uh, re refurbishment how to refurbish uh, the uh, multi apartment buildings thank you for your attention if you have some questions be 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 free to uh, ask or send your uh, or set to or send uh, through the chat option yeah hi davo um i i, I would like to say that i am great fan of the EMI's uh, platform because as you I mentioned before, it's one of our good practice from our Croatian partner, the Environmental Protection and Energy Efficiency Fund. And But I have a question related to the EMI's. Uh, what technical or implementation challenges have been faced during the adop adoption and operation of the EMI system in Croatia? But first of all, if you don't have internet, you don't have EMIS. <laughs> Let's say that. Uh, uh, for example, if we are talking about smart, uh, if about if we were talking about remote metering systems, for example, companies that are installing that uh, equipment for us sometimes do not mm, do the, do not uh, maintain that equipment. So we do not do not collect uh, data from the metering points, or for example, um, or for example, in if we are talking about uh, public building, uh, we have a res we had a resistance in F at first when we were trying to uh, implement EMIS on some public building, for example. Uh, you EMIS users, which were designated to input data in EMIS, uh, had the resistance in working in EMIS for uh, because I won't do that. I didn't. I am not paid for that. Uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, uh, and that kind of that kind of challenges. But as I said, we are pushing the automatization so that we can uh, put our users. Uh, so that we can assure the work of our users so they have only have had have to uh, monitor the consumption and monitor consumption and to alarm uh, their superiors or the technical technical service if they have some uh, over uh, over over range over range uh, consumption okay and I have another question about the what is your opinion on the feasibility and potential expansion expansion of the ME system beyond public buildings, for example, into private or residential sector in Croatia? Uh, yes, we have we have many plans for that for uh, for uh, for that. Uh, for example, uh, we have a plan. To implement uh, implement EMIS in the industry sector in Croatia. Also, as I said, we are conducting the project of uh, of uh, in introducing EMIS into the multi uh, into residential center into re residential sector. As I said before, so yeah, we have many plans. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Davor, um, congratulations. Um, I'm a big fan of making uh, such tools compulsory simply, and then uh, you have a huge deployment effort. But there was also a huge transfer to other countries. Um, 
yes, is yes. The... Who, who owns who owns the package and if a region wants to start uh, introducing emis in their region what do they have to do emis emis is a property of ministry of construction of croatia so uh, so uh, they contact the ministry or us so we go into the uh, into into the negotiation about transferring the knowledge and know how to the other other countries so in principle you are the first point of contact for this yes 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 because every every of uh, every of the mentioned uh, countries has the different different functionalities and different models which are their uh, consumption is based on for example malaysia is uh, malaysia is monitoring the consumption of the of its uh, industry sector and all other all other uh, countries are uh, are monitoring the public building sectors mm. and, and public land. Very interesting. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your Thank presentation. You. Thanks for the questions, Bea. Then let's hear from um, Costas. Costas is presenting us a, a tool specifically uh, made for hotels. Uh, Costas, the floor is yours. Hello, you Karin. You have to unshare, Davor. Yeah, yeah, I'm sharing. Yeah, I'm Thank sharing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See you. Yes. Hello, Katarina. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for giving us the, the opportunity to share the platform Echo Hotel Plus with you. And uh, I believe that you are seeing my presentation right now. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kostas Liguris, and I am the head of operations in Innoveco, the company that has developed the innovative Echo Hotel Plus platform. I'm going to present you why the platform is needed, how does it work, and how can I, it help in the crucial road to carbon neutrality. The shift towards sustainability is not a luxury, but a, a, a certain necessity for our existence and growth, and in particular for the hotels. Transition towards carbon neutrality is essential for the sustainability and development of the hotels in terms of energy consumption and extending to their environmental footprint. The platform Eco Hotel Plus provides the opportunity to initiate what we all understand as crucial, enabling us to address the issue at hand. This initiation involves documenting analyzing and managing the energy and carbon footprint consumption of the hotels. It helps to identify the most energy intensive areas quickly, facilitating and examining easy reduction methods. It forces the hotels to improve their environmental image through corresponding environmental certification that we provide. Using the platform, hoteliers can easily quickly and affordably have a detailed recording and uh, representation of the energy consumption in its entirety, as well as distributing monthly uh, and per overnight stay throughout the hotel's operating pro period. Moreover, hoteliers can see how they compare to similar hotels in consumption areas. With these valuable insights readily available, easily, quickly, clearly and economically available, hoteliers can make significant decisions that will lead them towards sustainability. The use of the platform is very simple. Hoteliers must input basic data characteristics of their hotel, such as location, number of rooms and beds, data necessary for calculations. Additionally, the capacity and operation days of the hotel heating and cooling systems, as well as energy and water consumption for, from respected invoices are, or, are also recorded. Once all necessary data has been entered at, at an annual level, the platform calculates the hotel's energy and carbon footprint based on national and international protocols and methodologies. The results include useful tables, graphs and indicators. We can view key indicators such as energy consumption per square meter, per overnight stay, and the corresponding greenhouse gas emissions. Additionally, 
we can compare our hotel's performance to the minimum and maximum values of similar hotels. This way, we can identify opportunities for corrective actions and performance improvement, achieving reductions in expenses and greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions as well. The Eco Hotel Plus provides a detailed analysis of the hotel's energy and carbon footprint. In this specific slide, we can see how energy consumption is distributed monthly and per overnight stay across different categories, such as air conditioning, heating, lightning, pools, etc. All you need to do is to input the monthly overnight stays and total, ener and total energy consumption. The platform takes care all of all the rest. We can also view and identify the areas that are strategically needed to be targeted to uh, initiate improvement actions per performance in, for performance enhancement. This way, these actions will be specific, effective, measurable, and comparable in, in the journey towards carbon neutrality. In this particular example, it is evident that there are opportunities for improvement in energy consumption in the air conditioning heating sector, where comparing the demo hotel with other hotels, when we, we compare the uh, demo hotel with the other hotels in its category. Also, we can draw useful conclusions from the correlation, between, correlation table between consumption and occupancy per month. To support the hoteliers in this significant endeavor, we have a specialized team of highly trained professionals who are dedicated to provide continuous assistance to hoteliers in achieving their sustainability goals. Along this journey, there are also reward certifications for, the, for every clear step taken aiming towards carbon neutrality. Already, 20 hotels in Crete have utilized the platform and large hotels across the country have been rewarded with their for their efforts in this regard. Also, we are happily promoting their sustainability efforts through our social media. Inoveco become, began developing the Eco Hotel Plus platform in the year 2021. Since 2023 was the kickoff year of the platform, which, is, which was significantly supported from the region of Crete, we have only one year of measurements for the respected hotels. So we will be able to have comparative results by the end of this year, by 2024. During a forest fire, according to the African folk tale, all animals run to escape the flames except from one hummingbird, the smallest bird in the world, which takes a drop of water in its beak and throws it into the fire. You are crazy. You won't stop the fire, an animal tells them. I know, the hummingbird replies, but I'm doing what I can. Everyone has a crucial part on the journey to sustainability. Our mission is to help all hoteliers understand theirs and provide tools to help them contribute their part. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm open to any question that uh, you may have. Hi, Costas. I, 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 to be honest, I like a lot your the Ecotel Plus uh, platform and application and how it works. And you've been talking about uh, that it compares the information with other mm -hmm. hotels, but that does this platform provide advice on hotel usage or recommendation based on records from other hotels? Well, uh, that is uh, our team's uh, job to do. Uh, the platform provides the, the comparative results uh, throughout the years. It compares the, the, the exact the same hotel's performance through the years. So each year that we run, uh, the the platform and the specific uh, year results we compare for the same uh, hotel the results and also we see what is the score uh, comparing to the other similar results so there we can identify and we can consult uh, and we consult the hoteliers 
where to focus and uh, where is the area for improvement. Okay, perfect. And another question, there is any incentive or support are offered to the hotels to encourage the participation in the Ecotel Plus platform and to adopt sustainable measures? Yes, please let me share for a moment again uh, the presentation and I will, uh, just a minute, I will focus on one specific slide where there is the, the our main tool Just a moment, please. Here we are. Sorry for this. Here we are. Mm -hmm. Well, this is our main tool regarding uh, your, your question. It's the, the clear steps and uh, the way to sustainability. The first step and the first uh, certification that we provide to, to the hoteliers using our platform is the certified level, which declares that uh, the, the hotel is uh, sustainably aware and is making the first step to, to calculate the carbon footprint and uh, increase the awareness. For that, we, we celebrate uh, this step, providing this uh, certification every year and communicating to our social media. The next step is in the second year, uh, we have the, compar the comparison that we discussed in the previous question from the previous year to the next for a specific uh, KPI. If there is an improvement, then uh, we provide the gold certification level to the uh, hotel. Uh, celebrating uh, this uh, this plant and the final uh, step is the platinum level where uh, after providing and proving that we are sustainably uh, making steps towards uh, carbon neutrality we can offset the the shares that we cannot do something about uh, anymore that we have made some steps we have a reduction we have reduced our carbon footprint and the, the other uh, part we have to, to, to offset. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot, Costas. Thank you very much. Okay, Costas, uh, we're having a, a few questions uh, from Charles. Uh, mm -hmm. He finds your uh, certification interesting and wants to know how it compares to the EU eco label. Well, uh, I'm not prepared to, to answer this question, so I, if you excuse me, I will keep the question and we'll come back uh, with, with an answer. Okay, good. We'll make these questions available to you in the chat. Charles, you will get your reply. Just uh, bear with us. Thank you, Costas, then. Um, let's take uh, the remaining minutes uh, and all the speakers, please switch their camera on and... Um, I would like to hear a little bit um, from mainly from uh, Johan and from Davor, because Kostas, you just said your system is so recent that you do not have uh, the big uh, perspective uh, looking backwards. But I mean, Davor's is uh, really old, introduced since 2008. And maybe, uh, uh, Johan, you also have some, some data. Um, beyond these immediate awareness and behavior uh, adaptations. Uh, if you look in the long term, are there any long term energy saving measures that are being implemented in the concerned buildings? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. So I'm I, from my presentation, we work primarily with households and sm some small businesses. And we find that when people have access to the near real time energy use data, they do make different cho choices around the home, or around their business to save energy in the short term. But then we also do get back in touch with them after they've had their smart meter installed for a while. And we do find that it does help them to make different energy efficiency choices, whether that is um, buying more energy efficient appliances, um, using more energy more flexibly, um, making changes to the home such as retrofit or sometimes when they if they go to buy a new a new car it might be an EV 
as opposed to a petrol car. Um, so I don't have any firm data on that, but our, our research does show that um, beyond the short term, they do make different choices in the long term to reduce their energy use. That's interesting to see. Mm. And, and and how about the, the public sector, uh, Davor? In, the, in, in, in your buildings, you have mentioned that every year 5% of savings are made. First of all, is that... Yeah. Accumulative? Yeah, is it five percent, and then next year beyond? No, no, no. Period. No, no. That's per year. Per year. Per year. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, the pool that was uh, that was uh, that the pool that was uh, that was uh, that was shown on the on the beginning. Uh, as like as oh, sorry, something dropped out. Uh, uh, as for you as uh, for you at home, uh, also in the public sector, you have to know on how on which way and how your energy and water is consumed, and which and which uh, and which uh, appliances or lighting or indoor lighting or uh, heating systems, ventilating systems are you are you propelling with that energy. Emis is Emis is focused on the small measurements. For example, uh, when we are when we are when we were doing that calculation, we put aside the buildings that were uh, retrofit. For example, they mm -hmm. change they change uh, they they put some thermal insulation on on their outdoor outdoor on on their object. That object was put aside. Emis mm -hmm. was only this five percent annually was only uh, is given is given from the buildings that were only using emis measurements mm -hmm. uh, conducting measurements uh, green office as we said we have a tons of educations uh, for uh, for the users in that buildings how to energy efficiency how to uh, conduct energy small energy efficiency measurements mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You have to see which is the 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 thing that is uh, consuming a lot of energy. Just yes. seeing the consumption is not enough. You must identify who is the 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 culprit. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> you have for a for, uh, different different profiles of consumption is in hospitals and schools or I don't know in kind kindergartens. Mm -hmm. You also have to have to acknowledge that part of the or that, that part of uh, of uh, consumption for the analysis. Yes, and this is why the sectoral approach uh, uh, makes uh, sense and, uh, uh, and and cost us. Uh, I like it that he has uh, the benchmark uh, that you can compare a hotel to a good performing hotel, and uh, then you see that you are off the mark. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's very crucial to, to be able to measure something and to be able to compare with uh, competition because uh, you may be uh, the star of uh, of the competition or maybe you're uh, in the last league. So it's very important to to uh, to see where we are heading and focus on uh, specific uh, actions. Uh, otherwise, you can run uh, towards uh, the cliff and you won't even know it. Exactly. They are, from your experience uh, uh, at the implementation level, uh, do you see that um, the smartness uh, triggers deeper energy saving investments? Yeah, of course. Um, because if you know where is the weakness in the building, you can go to the heart of the problem. And the only way is about to have a smart system that inform you about the consumption that you have, uh, what consumption, electricity, uh, and go on. And also, if you improve the building with renewable energy, for example, you know where when you need to consume in the building and when not to use more in daily light instead at night, or something like that, you know. Um, I have a question for Davor. Are you planning to develop any guide on how to use public buildings based in the EMIS, uh, um, EMIS uh, platform? Uh, which kind of guide do you think we have? We have uh, uh, some of um, uh, literature for green office how to uh, how to uh, act energy efficiency energy efficiency energy efficiency uh, how to energy efficiently 
act in the your daily work but okay. for example for example how to i don't know um how to how to um how, how to, to use lighting for example yes, for yes, the yes, user yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that all of that is is all of that is uh, mentioned in the in this in this brochure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, we don't have uh, all so much uh, time left. Um, I would like uh, um, to have from each of you a last round. Um, where I ask you for what you think are the most important points uh, uh, that uh, we have heard uh, today. And please, at the same time, answer the question, what can local and regional authorities do to enhance smart energy management in the buildings in their territories? So how about we go in order of uh, um, appearance? Uh, so Johan, you start. Uh, yes, of course. I think it's it's been really interesting. I obviously come at this from the consumer and the household perspective. And I think often the conversation um, forgets the consumer. Um, so I'm always championing that and remembering that energy consumers and households are at the heart of all of our work. Um, less so when we are talking about businesses, but we look at small businesses as well. And I think it's important to understand that the energy consumer is at the sharp end of the impacts of the changes and the policies that are made. Um, but what I've really enjoyed from today is is getting a different perspective of how all of these things are interconnected. Yes, energy consumers are involved in all of this, but there's so much that can be done um, on the back end to help consumers make more energy friendly choices. Um, and what was the question that I was meant to ask, answer for you? <laughs> yeah, what what uh, can regional and local authorities ah. do if they want to enhance um uh the smartness of the building yeah. in their territories like uh, yeah. be it in the public sector be it in the private households or for companies i think we've found especially over the last few years is that collaboration is key um if you try and go it alone and make all the changes by yourself you can only do so much but programs like this webinars like this sharing our, our learnings and our, our understanding um, just helps to en enrich our work. And I think uh, it, it makes a bigger impact. I think we can all be going back to uh, to what Costas was saying, uh, one hummingbird on their own can only do so much, but if lots of hummingbirds work together, uh, then we can make a bit greater impact. That's a beautiful one, actually, Costas. I love it. <laughs> okay, Davor, what's your takeaway say, and the advice I, for the regions? I would say use emis as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> much possible because Emis is always here. Uh, he is collecting data when we are sleeping, when we are not working, when we are not in the objects. Emis has an alarm system for uh, informing you if you have some, uh, if you some, if you have some over 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 range over range consumption. Uh, Emis is flexible. Emis can adjust to other to other uh, information systems. To other to other uh, remote systems, to other smart metering systems, I don't know. It is possible to uh, connect Emis with, I would say, pretty much everything. Okay, and your takeaway from the other people? Uh, yeah, uh, hotels. We had I had a, a report from somebody from France, someone something from uh, from friends to uh, hotels to to uh, building type of hotels in M is from Croatian uh, M is objects uh, but I don't know when when I when, but I don't know uh, where in which way uh, that went on okay we'll watch out for it Costas your takeaways and the advice for the regions well, uh, my takeaway is that uh, the, there is a the technology, there are uh, the ideas. Uh, I agree with Johan regarding uh, the collaboration is uh, very important because uh, no one can do it uh, on its own and uh, everything is out, where, out there, the dots are there and uh, initiatives uh, like uh, the one that we're participating in is trying to connect the dots in order to, to have the, the full picture. Uh, we have to increase awareness, and uh, that's the, the most important, and that's uh, why uh, Johan is working on uh, Davor with, uh, with the systems that, uh, with the EMIS, 
It's very, very important to know what we are doing, to know what we spend. And that's why we are trying to uh, to increase awareness with uh, in the hotels, but in, in all sectors. So that's, I think, the, the key point here, to increase awareness, to understand what we're doing and uh, which is uh, our power, the power of wood one and uh, the power of the, the collaboration, the unity. Thank you very much. And Bea? Well, I think that they have covered um, most of the file that I was thinking about, but I would like to highlight a point that this is smart management system and with this good practice you have here, um, a reference uh, allow a deeper understanding of the building, you know, for the users and allow you to know how to use your building, how to use your house. And as a technical point, uh, not only a technical, technical point, sorry, as a user, it allows you how to use your home. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's a, it's an excellent point. And uh, if you have the data, you react to it. Yeah. You almost cannot help it. Yeah? And with the energy prices rising, you react double as fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, uh, for your contributions, uh, uh, for your takeaway points. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I think it was interesting discussion. I hope uh, um, I have gained uh, insight. I hope our audience has. And um, so before I, we close the webinar, I want to announce uh, a thematic event uh, that uh, maybe fits uh, in this uh, topic. Not exactly. We're not exactly talking about uh, uh, smartness, but we're talking about uh, buildings. Uh, we're talking about the existing building stock and uh, the renovation wave. So uh, uh, the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform is organizing an in-person event uh, in Vienna on 23rd of uh, uh, May. And uh, we will have several uh, good practices from Monitory featured. And you can discover one-stop shop models and what public authorities uh, can do to foster and speed up and scale up uh, the, the renovation of mainly the, the private residential uh, buildings. So uh, if you are a partner in Interreg Europe uh, projects, uh, you have received an invitation, sign up, Simon and us, we're waiting for you. Okay, so with that, uh, we have come uh, to an end uh, of today's uh, webinar. Um, to me, this has given several ideas of uh, new topics uh, around um, smart energy systems. We should definitely look into the digital toolbox uh, for the energy communities. And we might want to revisit uh, the smart charging for e-vehicles, uh, which I also, also think is uh, very important. So uh, I hope you have found it uh, equally uh, inspiring. And uh, thank you all to uh, the contributors uh, and uh, to my team and to the audience. And I wish you a very good uh, afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>